We're so glad you joined us for the latest episode of Conversations That Matter. And today we're talking with Tanya Cooper, who is a law professor at Pepperdine University. And her areas of specialty include domestic violence as well as sex trafficking. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and I have my purple ribbon in honor of that. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Great to have you. So with that, let me begin with the first question today. While domestic violence is a, a phrase that we often hear used a lot, not many people really understand what it is. So can you start us off today by sharing a definition of what domestic violence really is? Yes. Domestic violence is a pattern of behavior in which one intimate partner uses physical violence, coercion, threats, intimidation, isolation, or emotional, sexual, or economic abuse to control the other partner in a relationship. Domestic violence does not necessarily involve physical violence, and it equally affects all aspects of our society, rich or poor, regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, class, or national origin. And that's the definition according to uh, the ABA, the American Bar Association Commission on Domestic Violence. I just like to say um, domestic violence is often synonymous with intimate partner violence mm. or dating violence, where there's the expectation of affection, romance, or mm. sex. Mm -hmm. And as more young people move away from the term dating to uh -huh. hanging out or hooking up, those contexts are also ones in which one partner can control the other with the use of coercion, threats, or violence. And in some jurisdictions, domestic violence can be defined more broadly mm. besides intimate partners to include other relationships. But when we say domestic violence, what we mean is those, those intimate partner relationships. Thank you so much for that. And you know, some folks, as we think of Domestic Violence Awareness Month, wonder if they know someone who's affected. Could you talk a little bit about the prevalence of domestic violence in our society? Yes. Domestic violence is considered a nationwide epidemic, even a global epidemic. Wow. One in three women will experience intimate partner violence over the course of her lifetime. One in 10 men will experience domestic violence over the course of their lifetime. It affects about 1.3 million women per year and over 30 million women in the United States are affected. 40% of California women will experience mm -hmm. some form of physical domestic violence and uh, 27.3% of California men experience intimate partner physical or sexual violence or stalking in their lifetimes. Um, just a couple more statistics. There were, um, these are two, from uh, 2014 and then 2017, 114 women were killed in LA County alone and half of those were killed by an intimate partner. And the domestic violence related calls to law enforcement were around 170,000, which is a 30% increase since 1998. And these numbers have only gone up during the COVID-19 pandemic, where more people were isolated and less able to seek help outside of the home. So Tanya, hearing those numbers, it seems as if it's not a matter of whether or not we know someone who's been affected by domestic violence directly. It's really a matter of have they felt safe enough to disclose to us their experience. And so that reality makes me realize that there are a whole lot of things that can contribute, not just to the occurrence of domestic violence, but even whether or not um, someone who is affected 
feels safe enough to disclose. And one of those contributing factors, which as a pastor, I think I can say this, which isn't talked about very much, is how religious communities themselves can sometimes actually contribute to the problem. So could you talk for a moment about some ways that faith communities either indirectly or directly have contributed to this problem? Yes. So the first problem I see, the ways in which religious communities, faith communities can contribute to the problem is by simply denying mm. that domestic violence happens in their communities. Maybe it happens elsewhere in society, but not in our faith community. So I don't need to talk about it as a faith leader, um, as a member of the congregation. I, I don't need to have this conversation in this space. And faith leaders will sometimes say, well, you know, I don't hear members of my congregation share their experiences of abuse. But the question for them is, are you talking about it? in your faith community, your church, your synagogue, your mosque, is this part of the church's ministry from pulpit to missions? And then when you start to talk about it, you'll be surprised by how many people you hear from. So that's the number one thing. And I would call that a more indirect problem. Uh, the second problem is much more sort of direct and problematic. And that is, and, and there are a lot of denominations um, that, that do this, um, that they use scriptures literally and out of context to encourage victims to forgive and forget, uh, to say that suffering is a virtue mm -hmm. or divorce is a sin or telling victims to turn the other cheek. Uh, and there's one story uh, recently, um, the last couple of years um, from the Southern Baptist Convention, a woman spoke um, with her pastor and had one black eye and he literally told her to turn the other cheek and then she had two black eyes. Um, and so again, that's denying the problem is happening and then victim blaming as well. Like there's something wrong with you or scriptures are telling you that you need to prioritize the relationship over your own safety. Wow. Some of the scriptures, I'd like to be more specific, that are taken out of context and then twisted are these, for example, from Ephesians 5, 22 to 23. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church he himself being the savior of the body. Or Colossians 3.18, wives, submit to your husband. Genesis 2.22, the Bible begins with marriage and Revelations 19.7 and 8, the Bible ends with marriage. 1 Corinthians 7.3, a woman has no control over her own body, but her husband does. 1 Corinthians 11.3, the head of a woman is man. And 1 Timothy 3, 4, man is ruler of their own house. In some congregations, particularly ones that uh, don't understand domestic violence or may not have a, uh, any women on staff because that's against their reading of scripture, that's against their interpretation of scripture, I'm sorry about the break in that question. We had an internet issue there for a moment, but Tanya had just listed for us a series of scriptures and uh, that on the surface might be used by some to suggest that a woman ought to stay in relationships that are um, abusive. So Tanya, picking up where we left off before that break, could you say a word about the importance of interpretation um, in re regard to the scriptures that you talked about? Yes, uh, and, and that is that these interpretations are not just coming from abusers, they're coming from victims themselves and they're coming from faith leaders who have internalized these, these scriptures, pieces of these scriptures, right? Out of context, out of the full fullness of the way in which they were written to sort of justify 
um, staying in a dangerous relationship or forgiving, forgiving and prioritizing the relationship over the health and safety of the victim. And so it's, it's very important um, in the faith community context to realize that the, they can, these scriptures can be used to justify abuse. They can be misinterpreted this way. Um, and again, one way to get around that is to educate the community, starting with the faith leaders about what domestic violence is. Great. So Tanya, we've talked about some of the ways that faith communities can indirectly or directly contribute to the problem. So let's flip things for a moment and talk about some of the things that faith communities can do to, to slow down or ideally stop the spread of domestic violence, particularly in their own community. Yes, and Woodland Hills Community Church and you, Pastor Craig, are perfect examples of what faith communities can do to stop the spread by talking about it, uh, by talking about it in, uh, in church, in small groups, what do healthy relationships look like? Uh, and, uh, and then by having lay experts in the community come and talk with the congregation, talk with the faith leaders about what is domestic violence? What are the resources available in the community? Um, those are honestly the best things to do and equipping churches with those resources to effectively respond. So if I, as a faith leader, am listening to a victim share his or her story, I know where to refer them. I'm gonna refer them to Haven Hills, our local domestic violence shelter, that has a number of services that can talk with victims about their options. I don't have to try to act like the expert. I don't have to try to convince them to stay or to leave. I just need to help connect this person who's now shared this with me with the resources in the community. And honestly, that is the best way. But there have been surveys done where pastors really don't know what services or resources are available in their community and where to refer people to help. So that's another thing that um, faith communities can do. I love that. Thank you for that. So Tanya, you've given us amazing information about the matter on kind of a global or larger level. I wanna take things in a little bit of a different direction now and talk about the matter of domestic violence in a more personal way. So I'm always interested with folks who work in the field about some of their earliest memories or experiences that drew them into the field. So could you talk with us about a time when you first became aware of what this thing called domestic violence was? Yeah, when I first started practice in Washington, D.C., I know there was a domestic violence courtroom, a specifically dedicated docket to hearing domestic violence cases. And I knew that that was a huge part of court business um, and lawyers practice. And I did work on in, indirectly worked on some domestic violence cases. I, I really started my career representing children in abuse and neglect cases. And what I realized that most of the families were black, brown, indigenous, people of color, mm -hmm. BIPOC uh, people. And I also started representing parents and in, in those child abuse and neglect cases. And I realized we have, there, there are huge, racial disparities in child welfare, where the children, but especially their parents have no agency or autonomy. They are sort of swept up into the system, very much like other aspects of our carceral state, like the juvenile justice system or the adult criminal system that predominantly penalizes and punishes um, uh, Black Indigenous people of color. Um, it was when I moved to Alabama 
uh, in 2012, so um, almost 12 years ago, 10 years ago rather, that I started representing victims of domestic violence. And then I became really aware of just how many people are affected. And also um, the fact that I, the, the best way that I can help them is by giving them agency and autonomy back. Victims have lost control because their partner has controlled them and coerced them. But by representing them in civil domestic violence cases, I've, I'm giving them that agency on a, and autonomy back through information where they then are empowered to make the decision that's best for themselves. And that's when I think I really realized what is domestic violence, how complicated it is, how often people blame the victim. Well, why didn't you just leave? It was so bad. Mm-hmm. And it's so complicated. And I, ever since then, I've realized this is a, this is a better way for me to help society um, and practice uh, a more fulfilling way for me to, to practice um, public interest law. So as I sort of hinted at earlier, Tanya, Many people think that domestic violence is just something that happens to strangers. And yet when we hear, heard those numbers that you talked about earlier, it's, it's clear that almost all of us must have known someone who is either experienced in the past or is currently living in a household where domestic violence is present. So for those of us who might just be waking up to the problem and wondering, I'm, I'm wondering if you might share with us a few signs that we could look for to see if a loved one might in fact be in the midst of a domestic violence situation. Yes, and this is a great question because we really don't know what's happening in anyone else's house and household. And sometimes we think, well, let me confront my, my friend who's the victim and help him or her get out of this situation could actually put them in greater danger. And a lot of times victims are also not aware that they themselves are in a uh, dangerous relationship. They, They don't know any better. All the relationships they've seen around them or that have been modeled as they were growing up around them have not been healthy either. So so they don't really know any different. And so confronting somebody or questioning their relationship before they're ready is is itself sometimes harmful. Um, And it could also keep the victim from disclosing um, that they are in a dangerous situation. But to answer your question, I think if you are concerned for a friend who seems like since they started this relationship, they're increasingly more isolated, uh, more inclined to go along with their partner's wishes, losing interest in things that they were once passionate about, those can be red flags. More often or not, more often than not, we think, oh, well, because they're going to visibly present a bruise and they're probably not going to, or they've covered that up. Um, but uh, they uh, increasingly just don't hang out with anyone anymore, or they are, um, they've been, uh, they had a great job and, and their new partner decided they didn't want um, the victim to work outside of the home anymore. So these are all, these all can be warning flags. And I would say in that situation, expressing concern for your friend, are you okay? Is everything okay? Um, I'm concerned about you um, is one way to signal, I am someone you could disclose to if necessary. Um, And a lot of times victims are also not sure that they are ready to do anything that that they know that the abuse is happening to them and they want it to stop Mm -hmm. but they're not ready or able to for a variety of reasons leave that situation because of finances because of children because of fear shame guilt you name it there's so many different reasons why people stay so 
it's really about expressing concern for them and being an ally for them in that moment, whatever they decide. And then later, if they do decide, you know, I am, uh, you know, ready. So we had an issue with connectivity again. So um, what we're going to do before we close today is I'm going to go off script for a moment and really ask Tanya to speak a little bit more about something she talked about in within the context of the court and when she first experienced clients and, and tried to help give them a sense of agency. So what I notice as a pastor is that many of us are very well intentioned with a loved one who may or may not be in a troublesome situation. So many times, as, as Tanya said earlier, we might either try to confront them or even take drastic action on their behalf, show up with a pickup truck with the expectation that we'll remove them from the house. And in many ways that can backfire and even draw, draw them sort of closer to their abuser in the sort of us against the world system. So we end up doing something that's really problematic. So Tanya, could you tell us a little bit more about this thing of agency and why it is so important to not jump in and try to take control of another situation? Yes, for two reasons. One is that leaving is the most dangerous time for a victim. And on average, victims try about seven times to leave an abusive relationship before they are successful in leaving it. And if they are not in a place where they are 100% ready with a specific plan of where they're going to go, what they're going to do, um, you could be putting them at greater danger. And there is a tendency, um, for many of us to try to help. Okay, well, you can uh, come here. You can come and stay with me. Um, or I somehow can make this better. And we really, the best way that we can help somebody is to say, who discloses, who's ready to disclose that they are a victim of domestic or intimate partner violence, I believe you. And mm -hmm. let me connect you with people in the community that can help. As lawyers, I train my, as a lawyer professor, I train my students to think about client-centered lawyering. Mm -hmm. So providing information that's consistent with their goals and values and giving them options. And then for each option, what are the pros and cons of that? If I were to leave, where would I go? What would happen? Is there, is there a chance I could be putting myself and my child or children or pets in danger if I leave the situation? Helping them think through all of those options. Or if I stay, what are the pros and cons? If I end the relationship, if I seek a domestic violence restraining order, this is what the process looks like. And here are the pros and cons. So in that way, we can become victim-centered helpers in the sense that we can say, I believe you and I can help you connect you with people who are going to identify those options for you based on your values, based on your goals, and then help you think through the pros and cons because it 100% has to be the victim's decision what to do, no one else. And so, you can, as the helper, be with them along the way and help guide them. And again, validate them. I believe you. And let me help connect you with people in the community that can help you. I know, uh, Tanya, one of the challenges I face as a minister is that in many mission contexts, one of my passions is trying to get people directly involved in the delivery of support or of ministry. And yet when it comes to domestic violence shelters and the process of someone leaving the home, it is a very complex situation because if shelters uh, addresses, for instance, were made public, then the abuser could seek out the victim there. So I just, I named that 
from um, a ministry context that says that even in, in, in ways we hadn't thought of or anticipated, um, the domestic violence, uh, we need to take some things into consideration that we might not otherwise be aware. So. Yes, and I would 100% agree with that. We have a tendency sometimes in faith communities to say, well, let me volunteer in the shelter. But a better way to help is to ask the shelter, what do you need? Which is what Wilden Hills Community Church does so well. We have Haven Hills as our regularly now as our part of our food drive. And this last month they asked for hygiene supplies and pampers and other products for victims and children. And that is a great way for faith community to get involved by asking the shelter, what do you need? Rather than, can I come in to your space without realizing the complexities of it and, um, and let them guide us in terms of how best we can help? I hear that theme both in the ways of dealing with loved ones in the situation, which is to not jump in and impose our agenda. And I also hear it in our support of our mission partners. So thank you so much for that. Tanya, thank you so much for all of the great information you've shared, not just from a head place of statistics and definitions, but from a heart and spirit place as well. And so as we close our conversation today, I would just ask, is there anything else that you would like to, to share with our listeners today um, that could increase their uh, ability to be there for those in need? Yes, I like to say that the single best thing that every single person can do is to be aware of domestic violence or intimate partner violence. It is a global epidemic. You probably know somebody affected by it. Everyone has a role to play to curb the incident. And by being aware, you are already part of the solution. Well, thank you so much for that powerful insight and way of wrapping up our conversation. And I want to thank our listeners today for being a part of it. And remember, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And so uh, please do what you can to inform yourself and share the information with others as well. Thank you. Thank you.